I'm Marcy. I am the director of international outreach. So I recruit grad and undergrad, but I only admit undergrad. So, so um, and Ryan, we'll just do a quick little while we wait for everyone, a couple of other people to join. Mm -hmm. So Marcy, your director for undergrad, international outreach and admission. I'm the director of graduate enrollment operations. So same thing as Marcy, but just probably more broad because we're a smaller team in graduate school. But I recruit, I, I visit you guys all if you're a grad student overseas, well, maybe we could travel overseas. So some of you guys might have met me up there as well. And then Andrew is our immigration team. Hello, I, I, I'm uh, uh, Andrew Knox. I, I think I've emailed with some of you. Um, so, so I am a lesson that you should, that you should know when you come to Valpo because I was coming to my office this morning and there was a train <laughs> and I have to stop the train tracks. <laughs> because we have lots of trains. There's here. lots of trains in Valpo, like like freight trains. They're not passenger trains, they're they're freight trains. And so I was stuck there waiting with nothing I could do. <laughs> yeah. So that's a lesson that you'll have to learn. I have to learn here in Valpo. So anyway, I, I work with the international student services and so um, yeah, I, I work with with the immigration side, but also a lot of cultural cultural things as well. We do a lot of events and cultural fun things in the international office. Oh, that my latest new job is I'm the advisor for the International Student Club, Valpo, and we call it Visa Valpo International Student Association. But if you guys look at your I twenties or your DS twenty nineteen, very likely you have Andrew's signature on it. Very likely. Yeah. Should we get this really going, Ryan? We're going to keep this informal. We are here to help you. We're here to talk a little bit about the campus, what you should expect in your visa interview, and answer your questions. But this is all about you guys and, and what you, we think you guys need to know. Yeah, Sarah, we're going to have to talk later. I just got your questions. You, you have moved yourself into some of interesting category. But good. Don't worry. Yeah, so okay. what I'll tell everybody, just general kind of webinar etiquette here. Um, if you'd like to just keep yourself muted um, for the extent of the presentation, there will be a couple sections where we might open it up for questions. There's also a chat, so feel free. If you think of a question, you want to make sure it gets answered later, just go ahead and type it in the chat, and we'll be happy to answer as many questions as you can throw at us. So. And let's have some fun. Everyone, if you want to put your name, if you, you can, um, but at least put your country you guys are from. We'll see how many countries we can get this one. Yeah. We'd like we'll to see what the uh, see how many we got here. All right, so here's just our agenda for today. We're going to give an update about COVID nineteen because this is ongoing, right? So um, we'll let everybody know what the current status is, some of the recent changes to Valparaiso University's policy, which you can expect from us, what the situation looks like here. I know some of you are probably living in places where there are some very big spikes going on right now in very serious situations. So we sympathize with everybody here. We really hope that things clear up soon, that we can uh, get to a better situation. And uh, for those of you where you've really been hit and impacted by it, um, you'll make it through. It's light at the end of the tunnel, all right? In America, we went through the worst of it already, it seems. We're coming out the other side. We're hopeful that the same situation will be true of other countries soon. So we'll talk about that briefly. Then we're gonna talk about why Valpo, because you're still at a stage where you're probably deciding, maybe you've made your commitment already, maybe you're still thinking, but uh, we'll give you a little bit more tidbits of information about why Valpo is the best choice for you. We'll go into the meat of our presentation, preparing for your visa interview. That's what we really wanna talk about here. That's the challenging aspect of uh, international admissions and studying abroad, right? For most students, that's the scariest part. Go sit, talk to the person in the little booth. They evaluate you, they judge you, it seems. And they really uh, look at everything. It's a very quick process and it can be a little scary and challenging. And some of you may not get it on your first try. It may take several tries. So we'll try to prepare you as best as possible, cover a lot of good information in that section. Talk a little bit about the step, stuff that happens after that. So rival details, orientation, registration details, and then we'll open it up for a broad Q&A at the end. So first of all, let's talk briefly about COVID-19 and the latest. So 
Many of you are about to receive notification. Some of you may have already received notification if you're an undergraduate student. But Valpo is going to require, as many universities are, that students for the fall intake <coughs> be vaccinated. Now, we understand that international students are kind of in a different situation than many of our American students, right? Uh, maybe vaccination is not as available in your country. Maybe your country is very low vaccination rate. You're struggling to get vaccines. Um, so we totally understand that. Uh, what we're going to do then is we're going to ex exempt international students from needing to have the vaccine when they arrive. If you've already been vaccinated in your home country, excellent. We'll accept any vaccine. That's anything that's on the policy. who list. That's they just updated. anything on the who list, right? I will so, find the who list. Uh, which I think is getting broader by the day. So it is. You it, it, mean the the WHO? Right, the World Health yes. Organization. So we know it. Who is? Um, not the Mongolian ban. Yeah, and not the British ban either. Yeah. So, um, but yes, uh, so we'll accept any vaccine on that list. And if you get here and you're not vaccinated, we're going to help you get vaccinated, all right? So when you arrive, um, you'll probably wanna let us know what your situation is. And there's going to be information you'll have to supply in advance. There will be steps you can take through your application portal to follow up with vaccination requirements in general. This will be a piece of it. And so we'll get you set up with a COVID-19 vaccination on your arrival if you haven't already received one. So keep us updated on your progress there. And uh, just to let you know, there's only nine current total cases on campus. We've seen numbers go down. There was no fourth wave um, in America, thankfully. So things are looking up in Valpo. Um, you'll see that requirements are easing across the board here. So um, I'm seeing mask mandates. There's no, I don't think statewide mask mandate anymore. Many businesses that you might go to while you're here require masks still. They probably will when you get here. So it'll be business by business. You want to be prepared if you go out shopping, say, to get supplies for, uh, you know, you start your studies or during your stay here. But um, things are starting to ease up a little bit. And Valpo is planning for in-person courses in the fall. So we have gone through a lot of hybrid courses, online courses for the last few terms. Summer was entirely online. That's why some of our uh, IT students were not able to start in the summer. We did not have the in-person coursework available for them. So that's why you're starting in the fall instead. So we are that, looking forward. But that forward. being said, even though the vaccination, you might still have to wear masks in class. We're still no. trying to figure out the particulars, but we will, the president is very, very committed to having face-to-face -face contact, face-to-face -face things. And even this past year, we've had a lot of activities on campus um, in, in spite of, you know, being a mixture of medium of instruction. Um, dorms had been open if you're an undergrad student, but he is very committed to doing it in a safe way, but having it in person. If you have a re religious or medical reason, there is exemptions for that. The medical one does need a doctor's note. The religious one, there you can read the guidelines, but um, but they are going to need approval. So you have to be exempt, or you have to be vaccinated by the beginning. At least started it by the beginning of class. Right. Um, but we are very committed to keeping it. And don't like I said, like uh, Ryan said, don't worry if you can't get it before you arrive. We will help you get it. But you do need to evac at the current rule to enter the United States is you do need a negative um, a negative COVID test to enter the US. And that's the whole US rules right now. Also, right. some of you guys might have seen this is sort of immigration COVID related is you um, India, even parts of Europe and Brazil um, are restricted from entering the US um, or in China. I don't know if anyone can assume are restricted from entering the U.S. without doing other things first. Students are all exempt from those rules. There's, you might have to follow a little different thing, but you might, and you see, keep seeing these announcements, but the F and J-1 visas are exempt from these rules because you guys are here for a different purpose than tourism, you know. So don't, if you have any questions, feel free to reach out to the three of us. We're really here to help you, to make you guys at ease and help you guys figure this out. 
And the United States is very concerned for its international students, which is why these exemptions exist. Mm -hmm. um, it was considered in the national interest to allow international students to continue to pursue their studies in the United States. So take it very seriously. We very much appreciate our international students. And if anybody wants any more information, we have very up-to-date information on the website, valpo.edu slash looking forward, looking dash forward. Um, if you go to valpo.edu, there's going to be a banner across the top on every page, and you'll be able to access the dashboard by going there. So if you want some information on the statistics, there's a lot there. Uh, it's much more in-depth than it was, say, the last time we did this webinar. And uh, lots of good information, and any updates that come through the pipe will go there first. So let's talk hey. a little bit. Go ahead. Um, did you want to open it up for questions, Marissa? Any COVID specific questions right now? No. Since we were talking about COVID, I thought would be at the COVID question. Okay, then we will move on. All right. So, Marcy, do you want to talk a little bit about yep. why Valpo? So, look, I always say Valpo is the best of locations. I've worked at a whole bunch of universities. I worked at Texas AM, I've worked at Humboldt State, I worked at the University of California Davis, I've worked at Drexel, I've worked all over the United States. And I've been an international student in two other countries. And I really think Valpo is a very, very, very special place and very unique. We always say we're a liberal arts college with strong STEM. And I mean strong STEM because Valpo's engineering, for instance, is ranked 13 in the United States. Um, a lot of our STEM is there's uh, only there's about what six STEM majors on the grad side, but the bulk of our STEM majors are on the undergrad side. But even grad or undergrad, we keep our classes sizes small. Our average class size is only 19 students. Our faculty to student ratio is only 11 to one. And our professors come teach at Valpo because they wanna know you as a person. They wanna help you achieve your goals. They help, wanna help you figure out what your next goals are. And that is really, really something important. That's why a lot of uh, faculty choose to work at Valpo is they want to get to know you and really want to get to know what and help you reach your goal if you're a grad student or undergrad student. The other really big important thing is hands-on learning. We don't want this to be, you know, theoretical. I mean, you're learning the theory, but then how does that theory apply to real life? And that's why, you know, Valpo overall has a really strong job placement rate, or overall our campus has a 97% job placement rate. I know the exchange students don't care about this as much, but you care about the hands-on learning maybe. And it's really helping you get those skills and, and apply them to real life, but also teaches you how to make connections. On the undergrad side, we have students who are doing engineering and music as a double major or minor. I have a, I have a Nepali student who has a double major in um, computer science, math, and then doing a minor in business. Uh, you know, so there's a lot of flexibility. And even on the grad program, if you're doing the master's of IT, you know, maybe you're taking the management track. Maybe you want to do the cyber certificate. We are really help here, and or if you're doing the master's in international economics and finance, there's a lot of different directions that degree comes in. And in fact, the person who leads the program is really interesting. She does develop, she's interested in food security and how does economics relate to food security. So we're really, you know, we care about what you want to learn and how do we, you know, take our program and make what you want to do to the next step. And that's really, really, really important to us. Um, you know, we have lot, we have scholarships or the grad school is very reasonable. So we're really here to help you um, achieve your goals. Um, we have a whole office on campus in the bottom of our library. Library is one of my favorite buildings on campus that has tutoring services. And a lot of our international students will even work as a tutor because uh, let's face it, Americans are not very good at math. Um, and so a lot of the, our tutors are down there. So there's math tutors, there's tutors to help you with your papers, there's tutors in different subjects and stuff like that. So where there's a lot of resources to help you be successful. Um, we are very diverse. We are a Lutheran university, but we have a Muslim, we have a, well, pre-COVID and hopefully back by fall, we have a prayer room for Muslim students. We, you know, our Martin Luther King Day, we say prayers in about four or five different languages. I'm not, I'm not a Christian even, and I love working at Valpo. So we really value students, and America, and we have a lot of American students who are diverse religions on campus as well. Um, the career services is there for, to help both grad and undergrad. 
And one of their jobs is to help you find a job on campus. As an international student, you're allowed to work up to 20 hours a week on campus. Um, jobs pay anywhere from seven to probably about $10 an hour. And a lot of our students may have two or three jobs, um, but no more than 20 hours a week during the school year. Is it enough for you to live on? Probably not, but it helps you with books and spending money and things like that. Um, the other thing the career services does is help you for when you graduate. They, they have workshops on how to write a resume. The American resume styles are a little different. They have workshops on how to do an interview, how to go to a career fair. We have several career fairs every year, and we have one that's specifically a STEM career fair for both grad and undergrad. Um, and we're really a community. There's lots of activities. And even this year, when we, some of our activities were hybrid with the mixture in person on, online, there were still tons of things to do on campus. I have to say it was really funny. We had some French exchange students that joined us in uh, January. They were very shocked. Things were open and things were happening on campus. Um, and uh, there's a lot, a lot of resources on campus and a lot of things. Anything I missed, guys? Ryan, Andrew, you want to add? That sounds great. The the career services. Um, so 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 the international office also partners with the career center to do some some international student specific uh, uh, career workshops. Like like we bring in former international students who are now working in the U.S. or other places in the world, and we have them do a little panel about how it was to to look for a job and to get a job as an international student. So. Um, really try to, to enhance the international student experience through that as well. Oh, I forgot to mention you can, that if you are studying science, technology, engineering, or mathematics as an F1 student, you can work up to three years after graduation, more or less on your student visa, it's called OPT. So that's a really cool opportunity. Unfortunately, if you're just doing you know, business, great business, like business management, you get one year. But if you're doing business analytics, and if you guys want to work, you know, if you uh, as an undergrad, and we can help you figure out what majors have that. Um, mo a lot of the grad programs, masters in international economics and finance, is considered a STEM major because it's very heavy in math. Um, so yeah, so the career service is really, really there to help you. And in America, and we don't tell you to use it when you're about to graduate. You use it throughout your education at Valpo. And also, um, just the. The Valparaiso community. I think that that when I was overseas, I uh, uh, I I lived in China and Japan in the past. Um, and when I was over, overseas, I think probably the most impactful, the most memorable thing was when I got to know people in the community. Um, you know, outside of just the normal professors and and students that I would meet. Um, and so and. Uh, uh, there, there are some people in the Valpo community that really love international students and, and have partnered with the international office for many years. There's some families and, and they, they really love to come and do, um, do some, some friendship family type events. So you can have the chance to meet a typical American family, maybe go to their house post COVID, you know, it's this past year was, was a little rough for that. We still tried to do some things, but not too many in-person house visits, but hopefully in the coming year, I, I really think it will be possible. So that's a really special part of being at Valpo too. Another thing that's really cool is about our location. I always say we're the best of both worlds. You know, I've been to, I think I've seen Nepal, I've been to a million times, I've been to Nigeria, I've been to Germany. I've been, so we are, I always say, but other countries that I see on here, but we're the best of both worlds. You know, so we are in a very cute college town and we are 72 kilometers from Chicago. So Chicago is the third largest city in the United States and it has everything you can imagine. Um, everything from if you're looking for an Indian grocery store, or if you're looking for this, or you're looking for a big museum, that's all right there in Chicago. And we have some museums of Valpo too. Um, but we are also, Valpo is very safe. And it has really good public transportation. A lot of small towns I've lived in in the United States don't have public transportation. So with your student ID, I don't care if you're grad, undergrad, exchange student, or, or full-time student, your student ID will get you onto the local bus system for free. 
and there's an app. I'll be honest, it does snow here. So, you know, that app is very handy in the winter. So you stand inside and you go, oh, the bus is coming. Okay, I'll run outside now. So it, it helps you figure out where to go and you don't need a car. There's also Uber if you do prefer that, but the bus system goes everywhere. And the bus even takes you to the train that will take you into Chicago. Um, if you get an internship in, over the summer in Chicago, um, there's a commuter bus that's just for people working downtown Chicago. And it leaves every morning. There's like several buses and they're really nice buses. And then they come back in the evening and they pick up right downtown Valpo and they take you right into the city and then bring you back at the end of the day. So there's a lot of options. It's the best of both worlds. You have the small, easy town and then you got the big city. The other thing that's really special is the cost of living. So I, I bought a house now, but before I was renting, I was renting a three bedroom house for only $1,000. So you got a couple roommates if you're a grad student or later on to your bachelor's degree. Undergrads, we do, if you're under 22, we require you to live on campus for a couple of years. But the cost of living is very, very reasonable here. And that's, that's really beneficial. The other thing is we do have a beach. That's the one showing in Chicago, but even here with about 15 miles, about 20 kilometers or so mm -hmm. to the beach and the bus will take you to the beach. And it's Lake Michigan and my boyfriend's from California and he keeps looking at the beach and going, wait, is that an ocean? And we go, no, it's not an ocean. But we, it was, I was out there last week and it was a lot of waves because it was windy. It really does look like an ocean, except fresh water, you don't have to deal with the salt water. So like I said, the best of both worlds, you got the easy, cute college town with tons. I can't even tell you how many coffee shops. I once tried counting. I mean, even just Starbucks, we have like four or five Starbucks, just in Valpo. And then, you know, then we have all these cool independent coffee shops right close to campus and stuff like that. And there's concerts downtown Valpo and movies uh, in the park. Um, hopefully we'll have popcorn festival, which is in September. Um, Indiana is known for its corn and we have a popcorn festival. Orville Redenbacher is a famous guy who made popcorn in the United States and he's from here. And so we have a big pop popcorn festival usually in September. And it's just a very, very active town if you don't go to the city. Anything anyone else want to add? Okay, cool. Um, one thing I would just emphasize here too, like Marcy said, it's a great location. It's the closest I think you can be to a major cultural center like Chicago while still having a nice small town American experience. So you do get the best of both worlds. You get to see what America is like at the smaller scale and you get to see that big American culture. Chicago is a very incredibly diverse and major intercultural city. So all kinds of things happening in all kinds of restaurants you could hope to see, cultural experiences, the symphony, the opera, many wonderful things you can see there. So that's a great thing location wise. Valpo is also the kind of university I think that you would really want to be at because we're a private liberal arts institution. It means we have a lot of specific expertise. We have a broad liberal arts perspective on education and higher education. We do have that STEM background too that is important to a lot of you. But it is also the broad experience um, of academics. And I think that's a really great thing, a wonderful thing that a lot of people like to come to America to experience and many American students as well. So you get to see a lot of great things. You get nice immersion in American culture and a wonderful educational experience. And there's also a lot of things going on at Valpo in terms of you know international experiences. We have lots of student associations. Um, there's lots of specific cultural festivals that we celebrate. Um, there's a banquet, you know, these sorts of things that we generally do um, pre-COVID times. But I think this fall with the great focus on being in person with the vaccination ubiquity, um, we're going to have a chance to experience a lot of these things again. So this is really a great time to start looking back into studying abroad and studying at Valpo. We're committed to excellence as well. So these are some old um, labels, but we have had updated ones recently. We're still one of the top colleges. You'll find us on a lot of lists, top colleges, best colleges in the Midwest, especially. And like Marcy said, our engineering rankings are incredibly high, very competitive um, across the whole country. So let's get into visa preparation. Andrew, you wanna take this slide? This is the hard part yeah. for me. For me. <laughs> 
Yeah, so so I I think that many of you I I see some of your names here. I I think that many of you had have gotten your I twenty or your DS twenty nineteen, and so so you will be getting your 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 F one or your J one visa soon. Um, so the first step there is to pay your CVS fee. So this is a fee that the U.S. government requires, um, and so you go to this website. You just can Google CVS fee, and I think you'll find it pretty easily. But that's the website right there. Um, so I think for the for the the F1 students, I think it's four hundred dollars. I need to look it up, but um, I think it's four hundred. I think for the J1, it's less than that, maybe two fifty or three hundred. I can't remember exactly, but you have to pay that fee, and so you get you print and keep a cof, copy of your CVS fee receipt, and then you bring that receipt to your visa interview. Um, it, and you have to you have to have that to schedule your visa visa interview. So you schedule a visa interview, bring that receipt with you, bring all the other documents like your passports, your obviously your I twenty DS twenty nineteen financial documents. Um, financial documents would be documents that would prove that you have enough finances, liquid finances. You know, you know finance, finances that you can use right now, not not property that is worth, you know, $100,000 if you sold it, but, you know, uh, finances that you have available right now, enough for one year. So that, that amount is listed on your I-20 or your DS-2019. Um, so you need to have enough available finances for one academic year. Of course, your admission let, letter. And there are some other there. documents as well that the embassy will require. They, I definitely agree with what Andrew says because the liquid is what they say. But um, in some of these more, in some countries, they've been asking for additional documents. So definitely have the bank statement or the bank letter saying you have the liquid funds and the scholarship letter if you got a scholarship from Valpo. Yeah. But also, it's not a bad idea if your parents or you, or you own property or you have your parents' salary. Bring those as well. You never know what they're going to ask. These interviews are very, very short, but you never know what they're going to ask. So bringing extra documents, just have yourself organized is not a bad idea. Yeah, yeah, definitely. I, I just responded to a student. I don't remember if that student's on this call or not, but just um, about whether or not they should bring property um, proof. Um, and, you know, that's a great thing. That also shows that you have a tie to your home country. And maybe that's in, in the next slide, but it's very important to show that you have a tie, you have a, a reason to go back to your home country. So property proof is great too. Yeah, um, you definitely want to make yeah. sure that you have all your paperwork in order though. So prepare well, make sure your admission letter is printed out um, in color too, right? Marcy and Andrew, I mean. So the I-20 yes. or the DS-2019 must, well, the DS-2019 we mailed to you guys. Uh, but the I-20 must be printed in color, guys. So yeah. I know sometimes you might have to go somewhere else to get it printed in color, but um, but it must be printed in color. Yes. So if, 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 for the I-20. My signature it, on there should be in blue. I know it's not a real strong blue on there, but it, it should be in blue. And then you also need to sign and date the I-20 or DS-2019. And of course, for the I-20s, we are sending you the electronic copy, and you can use that during this COVID time at least. And for the, the J1 uh, DS-2019s, um, we are sending that to you. So sending you the paper copy. So let's get into some tips about the interview itself. And this is the scary part. Everybody wants to be sure they're prepared. So of course we said, Make sure you have all your paperwork in order, passport, receipt for your CVS fee, your I-20, your DS-2019, your financial docs, broadly, like Marcy mentioned, because you don't know what they're going to ask. They may get into the particulars just to make sure that everything is on the up and up and they think that you can afford it, um, your admission letter, all that good stuff. But when you actually get to the interview, and you've made sure to schedule it far in advance. Do not wait till the last minute. Some of these queues are very long. Sometimes you get appointments a month or two out. Um, sometimes you get them fast, that's great. But be sure you do it far in advance. And once you arrive, 
like Andrew said, the first and most important thing is to establish ties to your country because uh, the F-1 visa is a non-immigrant visa. The idea is not that you're going to be immigrating to the United States. The idea is you're coming here for education, for maybe work experience with your OPT or CPT, and you're going to return back to your home country. You know, some of you may pursue other pathways once you get here. Maybe you want to try to stay on an H-1B visa, but that's not the purpose for obtaining an F-1. The F-1 is purely for studies, non-immigrant. And work and, experience. And work experience. And I think uh, the most common reason for rejection is going to be that um, they suspected you were intending to immigrate to the immigrate to the United States, right? So if they don't think that you're going here just for studies, if they don't see those ties to your home country and the reason for coming back, then they're going to reject your visa. So you're and applying really, for the wrong yeah. reasons. Yeah, and it's okay to mention that you hope to do a job work experience afterwards, but you can talk about how that work experience. Like I said, this doesn't apply to the J's, but how that work experience will help you on the way home. You know, you are allowed to, and, and it may even be, you know, that you're taking out a loan in India and that's how you're paying for your tuition and you'll work for three years afterwards, which you can legally do on your student visa. And then you're gonna um, pay that back and then you'll have that work experience and you'll transfer that back to your home country. Or I have a student who, the reason he's doing those three majors is he wants to start a computer business back in Nepal. So. You know, everything you talk about from your education to your work experience, how do you tie that back into home? Also be brief. I know I'm not very brief, but you guys have a very short time. I don't care if you're F or J, you have a very short time in that little window. And I've sat there because I've had to go the, to the embassy and I've watched them do these visas. And I have friends, a lot of, I, I don't know how many friends I have that are counselor officers. You guys usually, these visa interviews are usually less than two minutes long. So be brief. Don't be me. Um, you know, that's why we'll come up, show you some questions. Think of the answers beforehand. Practice them. Well, I always tell students another good way. This is the first step in preparing for your visa interview. But the other thing is knowing where we are, um, knowing that we are close to Chicago, knowing why you picked Valpo. They want to know. There's a thousand, two thousand or yeah, two thousand universities in the United States. Why Valpo? That's a really. That's why we gave you some of that information. Sometimes I tell students another good way to prepare is to see, um, to uh, look up, to look up, uh, um, watch our YouTube video channel. Our, we have a great YouTube channel. Watch those videos. Your answer should not be the same as the person sitting next to you. Everyone's answer should be a is a little bit different. It's a personal thing. Why Valpo? How I'm paying for these. So if you, if you sound exactly the same, you found an answer, they said, oh, they always, this is the answer they want. Then no, they don't. They want your story. They, and if you, they ask you if you have a relative in the United States, tell them you have a relative. They know these things. Be honest, be calm, and be brief. And this is the hard part. It's okay to smile. We told you you can't smile on your passport photo or your visa photo. It's okay to you know smile at the visa officer. Feel at ease. All right. Speak for yourself. I like that bullet point. Be authentic. If you're not authentic, they'll pick up on it, right? So you have a lot of information that this webinar is going to give you, both about the interview process, but also about Valpo, also about the city, the location. And these are things that they'll be looking for. They'll want to hear your authentic story. You want to appeal to them in order to get them to approve your visa. And of course, make sure you have your supporting documents. Um, you know, consider how you will pay for your studies. That might be something that comes up. That's Big question, they always ask. That's why we tell you, have, be prepared with your financial docs. And my parents are paying for it is not an answer. How are your parents affording? Uh, or if you have a, if your husband's helping you out because he's working, that's fine. You just have to be prepared to answer the question. And it, and, and like I said, think of the, a couple of different answers. You know, my whole family is contributing. That's fine. My grandma, my aunt, and my uncle are all helping me out. Then make sure you have bank statements from all those. Um, be, be prepared to answer. This is seriously, besides ties to home, how you're paying for it is the biggest question. You know, and and if you have a good answer, if you, I don't care if your parents are farmers in you know, rural Nepal, um, you know, there could be ways that you're paying for this. Or I have a scholarship. You know, those are all good things. 
Yep. So be authentic, be prepared, and don't be afraid to talk about it. So we said before, you know, it helps, I think, to um, actually prepare yourself by doing some talking, maybe do mock interviews. We do that sometimes. Um, practice in front of a mirror, if nothing else, right? And be ready to talk to a person, right? Be ready to share your story with them and speak with them on a human level, right? All important yep. steps. And when I do visa prep, the biggest mistake I see students are doing is I ask them one question and it's 10 minutes later and they've answered and they've answered the question. You don't have that long. You have to be brief and concise. You know, what is your personal story? And make sure your personal story includes returning to your home country. It's quick, it's in and out. And here's another important thing just to keep in mind, right? You may get rejected on your first try. It happens. Many of the students at Valpo currently were rejected on their first try. Some of them were rejected on their second and some on their third. So we've seen students go through this process, um, not commonly, but certainly it happens and they still make it to campus. So persistence is key in keeping up your optimism, all right? So don't be discouraged if you get rejected on your first try, right? So just be optimistic. If you do get rejected, let us know and we'll be happy to work with you. There's time to schedule another interview. Um, that would be great. Otherwise, we're happy to work with you on deferring your admission to the next intake that's available to you. So keep at it. And I know I've had students before who've deferred three or four times, and then they finally make it on that last time. And of course, we're always happy to see them here in Valpo. I had a Nigerian student last year um, who actually got their visa in March about when COVID, the pandemic started, um, and then was supposed to, and then couldn't, actually had their visa, but then couldn't get in the United States. And that because they moved her finals to the month of August about when we were starting. And she finally made it to us in January of last year. So, and we understand, I don't care if you're F or J, something might happen and you might need to defer a semester. Or I think some of the exchange students might have already deferred a whole year, um, if I'm correct. Um, but we are willing to work with you guys. And we know a lot of things are, are out of, if you do a perfect visa interview, things are out of her control right now. This is just a wild, wild world we're all in. And we're willing to work with you. Just the most important thing you can do is communicate with us what's going on. And we'll try to figure out what the best strategy is for you. That's right. Um, so. Mar Mar Marcy, um, is it true that, that sometimes students will need to, um, need to ask for the emergency visa appointment? Depending on what country you're in, it is still possible. Um, and the that if you have a program starting in the next couple of months to request an emergency appointment, if you are having some countries are saying they're closed for visas. Um, and I don't think any of the countries I saw mentioned here, except maybe Nepal. Um, you well, can re go into there. I think Nepal is keeps opening and closing. Um, you can go into the record and ask for an emergency appointment. There's a way, and you just go onto the visa or consulate's website and look for emergency appointment. And then you can email them and say, hey, I'm a student and my program is starting August 17th. I need an emergency appointment. And that sometimes can help you if appointments are filled, sometimes that can help you get a sooner appointment or if the consulate is um, technically closed, um, they they have worked out with us. And we've had, um, we've had, we had what, that Zimbabwe and a student from Bangladesh who both have yeah, those emergency appointments. I had that problem too. So um, yeah, from Germany. So I had to, yeah, the first available um, appointment was in November. So I had to schedule the emergency appointment and then it was uh, like 17th of June. So it, it, it got um, uh, allowed pretty quick. So it was just uh, like one day or so. So yeah, yeah students are a priority. Thank you, Mark. Students are a priority. International students are a priority. So you, you're going to go, oh, they won't care. I'm a student. You guys are a priority to the U.S. government. There's tons. In fact, there was, I've seen it in the newspaper. If you guys are from Nigeria, we just sent a whole bunch of articles out to the Nigerian students. You guys are their priority. So it, you, it, I know you're like, but I'm just a student. You guys are the priority. So if you need an emergency appointment, please request it. If you can't figure it out, 
just email us, okay? We're really here to help. Yeah, we've been seeing visa approvals recently, so that's really encouraging, both for you and for us. Um, we saw Zimbabwe, I think Nigeria. Mexico, I just got one from Mexico. Uh, several countries that had not approved it for a, for a long while because of the pandemic are, are doing it now, so that's great. So it's happening, so get out there, schedule your interview if you haven't already, prepare for it, and uh, just keep us posted on the process. One of the nice things about Valpo, we care about every single student, I guarantee you. So we'll work with you through the process. We'll do whatever we can to support you and we'll look forward to seeing you here uh, one day. Um, should we open up for questions for that? Maybe if anybody well, has any let's questions Let's go over this stuff we... first. Okay. So everyone's I-20. Well, Andrew, why don't you take this one? Yeah, so 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 everyone's I-20 or DS-2019 should have a start date of Tuesday, August 17th. So that is our our orientation start date. Um, so that's when we hope to see you all here in person. Um, now, now, you can come in up to 30 days before that date. So, I mean, you, you may not choose to come in, you know, uh, uh, at, at the end of July. But, you know, you can come in, you know, several weeks before August 17th. So we would probably recommend that, well, I guess it depends on the students. So many students will come in um, come in right before maybe on the 15th, 16th, um, but some students will choose to come in a week or two before to kind of get prepared or maybe tour, tour around the US a little bit. Um, so August 17th, that's the day that we are looking forward to seeing you here at Valpo. Um, and there's other orientations that week. Uh, there's grad school orientation. Um, I can't remember the exact day. Is that the 20th, Ryan? Or It's not set just yet. Okay. They're reserving the rooms right now. So we should have that date soon, but it will follow shortly after okay. our orientation. So our international student orientation will be August 17th. And, and that's grad and undergrad together. Yes. Yeah. And then there's grad school and there's the focus, which is the undergrad orientation. Um, and then classes start. Uh, about one week after that on August 25th. And um, internet undergrad, all student orientation focus is the 18th. And yes, you're required to go to both, both for grad and undergrad. You go to the international focused one and the, um, and the all student one. So you are required to go to both of the orientation. If you're yeah. undergrad student and you have registered for focus, um, you will probably get an email this summer uh, setting up an appointment to make make your schedule um, with it with virtually and also you'll probably get an email about housing um, and it will probably have a survey saying are you an early morning person you're a late night person you know what kind you know what's your study habits are you a clean person you know so that they they do roommate matching over the summer so you'll get those emails if you're undergrad students undergrads if you're under age 22 you are required to live on campus for at least three years Exchange students always live on campus. We don't care your age if you're an undergrad student. And so um, that you will be able to move in the weekend before into the dorms before orientation um, and stuff like that. But if you do arrive early and you don't have your vaccine, let us know so we can get you guys all set up. Um, last last week, that was last week, we, we were giving out the Johnson. Um, we have every, well, we have three vaccines that are currently approved in the United States. We have Johnson. We call it JJ, and we have Pfizer and we have Moderna, and you know Pfizer and Moderna are two shots. So we've been giving different ones. Well, you know, consistent with what you're getting the first time, but we've been, we've been able to use the Johnson. So it might be one shot and you're done. That's what we. That's the nickname for that. And so, but if you come in early, please let us know, and then we can get you scheduled earlier for a vaccination if you were not able to get one in your home country. Right. And the start of classes, like Andrew said, is August 25th. Very important date. So if you anticipate arriving late, if things just don't work out so that you can arrive well in advance, um, you have that big window to arrive in advance. But once the start of classes hits, you have a very small window afterwards to try to get in and start your classes and still be able to participate in the semester. So I know on the graduate school side, we can try to be very flexible. We try to look at the situation student by student. Technically, you can enroll in classes up to the add drop date, which is usually somewhere around a week after the start of classes. 
So there's just a little bit of wiggle room afterwards and not much once you pass at the add drop date. So I would highly advise if something comes up and your travel plans are disrupted or your visa appointment is late, please keep us updated on the situation so that we can advise you on the best course of action to go forward with. Because it may be that the best option for you is to defer to the next intake. It may be that we can find ways to get you to start um, still this semester, but it's going to be very case by case in individual situations. The key here is just communicate. If you see some problem, if you're having trouble with your visa, getting a visa appointment, we are really here to help you. We don't care if it's urgent. We we're very, that's the other advantage of Alpo is it's very much personal service. Please communicate with us and we really can help you figure out the next steps. That's right. Um, Andrew? Yeah, so, <clears throat> so um, the arrival, hopefully, um, the the couple days before the orientation, we we'll, we will we will give more information on 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 arrival details coming up in a series of pre arrival emails, and those will probably start in June, maybe about a couple months before the before the orientation date. So, but you can get a head start on all that information. Basically, the summary of all the information that will be in the pre arrival emails is at that website. So if you go to valpo.edu slash international slash admitted dash students, or you know, just go to valpo.edu slash international and you'll find the admitted students tab there. Um, <clears throat> then you'll see all the information that we will be uh, putting out in those emails. So O'Hare International Airport is the one that most people fly into. Um, there's another airport called Midway in Chicago. And that's, you know, a big airport, but it's more the domestic flights. Um, but most people fly into O'Hare. And uh, again, that that uh, admitted students section of our website and our emails will tell you about some transportation means, you know, things have changed and are changing, hopefully for the better now, um, about how to get transportation from the airport to Valpo. About a year ago, all the transportation, the public transportation stopped. So that was a little rough, um, but things are opening up more and there are different options. So um, look at that website and make sure you uh, keep an eye out for those emails from international at valpo.edu, probably starting in June. Andrew, are you guys starting a Facebook page for the admitted students for fall 2021? Yeah, so I, I believe that we will do that. Um, that will probably go out in the first pre-arrival email. Um, so yeah, I, I probably will be doing that. Um, you know, just kind of a little question here for the students. Um, is Facebook something that you use or that you would use to connect? Put it in the chat. You, could, you, or... could, you know, there's a little thing you could, if you use Facebook, you could you not to virtually, you could virtually show it your hand. Yeah. I know in a lot so of countries, people are still, people it's really divided not, by country. Not really, can start to use, yeah. So yeah, that's always something that we're kind of um, trying to navigate too. We know that students use different things, but you know, Facebook is still something that is pretty accessible to most people. So we probably will we'll have a Facebook group, um, but we'll send out more. WhatsApp, I know a lot of students use WhatsApp. Yeah, so. Yeah, great. Okay, thanks for the, that. Yeah, that's always very helpful and I'll take that into consideration. Probably in the first pre-arrival email in May or June, we'll, we'll have some information about that. Um, one note here on this slide, said you will take a bus, train or Uber taxi from the airport to Valparaiso. So some of the students here, I mean, some of you may have already traveled. Maybe this is your first time really traveling. So I know one thing, when you arrive at O'Hare, it's a huge airport and it can be a little scary, right? So you're in Chicago. There's gonna be a lot of people, a lot of hustle and bustle, a lot of people barking orders and things like that, right? I would strongly recommend you have your travel plans sketched out before you get here, that you have an idea of how you're going to get from the airport to Valparaiso 
And if you have any problems with picturing how that's going to work and what your strategy will be, that you get in touch with us. And we're going to be happy to provide you with guidance on it. We can talk to you about what the experience will be like, what you're going to want to do, what may be the best way for you to come from the airport to Valpo. <clears throat> we're always looking into new ways to try to assist students with getting here on campus. And so, you know, we'll keep you posted if anything changes, but um, bus, train, Uber, taxi, those are the top methods of travel. And if you have any questions about how those are going to work, what the experience is going to be like, uh, please let us know in advance and we're going to be happy to talk to you about it individually. And in the past, people have used the Facebook group to say, okay, let's all try to arrive on the 15th together. And even if you have to wait a couple hours for the other people to arrive on the 15th, you guys share Uber here. And that's something, especially, you know, the train is actually really, really, really not that bad. But I wouldn't want to do it as my initial arrival because you're really super tired, and you know you are, um, and you're really tired, and you might have a lot of luggage that first trip. So we usually say, yeah, take something more direct. But if you could, you know, arrange for a couple people to come at the, in on the same day, you guys could share transportation and stuff like that. Yeah, yeah, I think it is really important, like Ryan said, to to map it out to know. Uh, what your plan is when you get there. I, I know I've been to different airports around the world and, you know, trans public transportation is so easy and so convenient, you know, just get there and take a taxi or, you know, figure it out when you get there. But the U S is a great place, but public transportation is not quite so convenient. So just make sure you have a good plan when you, when you, there are. is Wi-Fi at the airport. Usually sometimes it goes in and out, but there is Wi-Fi. There is also ways to get a SIM card um, right at the airport, a temporary SIM card or stuff like that. A lot of people have been doing the Google thing before they come. I don't know how exactly how that works, but they've paid for a Google service and then they switch over to a different plan once they get to Valpo. Um, someone asked about the cost of living. If you're over 22 or a grad student, um, I was renting a three bedroom house for around a thousand dollars. So if you had three or four roommate, two or three roommates, you could probably live for under four to five hundred dollars, including utilities off campus. Um, and but and there's tons of apartments right off campus. Um, literally, you can stand on campus and hit some of the apartment buildings with rocks. You should throw rocks though. Um, but that's how close they are. Um, and once again, we do have that great bus system in Valpo and your student ID once you actually get here. And you get your student ID, both for grad and undergrad. The bus is completely is included in your tuition, the local bus system. You cannot live in Chicago. I'm going to repeat this again. You cannot live in Chicago and then try to commute out to Valpo. We've student, seen students do that, and that does fine until the snow hits. And so, so you know, you have to live. It's real. I mean, we're not going to check, but I, but it's not going to be a good experience for you if you try to live in Chicago and commute out. Uh, yes, Google Voice. Um, um, yeah. yeah, excuse me. Just uh, you said that um, undergrad students are uh, can live on campus, but uh, but I'm a grad student, so is it possible for me to live on campus too? Because it I is. would like to. <laughs> okay. Yes. Yeah. I I know. I got the email from you, Mark, and I just didn't respond yet. But yeah, there there is a there is an option for grad students to live on campus, so that should work out for you too. And there, and okay. you'd probably be with the upper division students. So, and okay. some of those are sweet apartments. Let me tell you. Thank you. Um, we have these loft apartments that are really cool. In fact, I lived in student housing when I first moved here for three months. Um, so, 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 and they were pretty, actually, pretty nice. Uh, graduate assistantships. Um, we don't have many of them, but we have tons of on-campus jobs. Anything you want to add to that, Ryan, about graduate assistantships? Yeah, common question we get. There is a limited number of them available. The programs usually request them when they have need of them. And um, there's an allotment that's set out in advance of the start of the semester. So the programs request, they get the allotment. And then when students usually start um, in their studies, they'll have availability to apply for them. So it's usually not a thing I think that starting students get access to. Um, most commonly reserved for students in like their second or third semesters. Uh, but there are some available. Um, but like Marcy said, if you don't have the opportunity to get an assistantship, um, then 
you still have opportunities to work on campus, sometimes even within the graduate school. So we have student aid positions in the graduate school. There's other opportunities on campus and we're constantly kind of looking for new opportunities to keep our students uh, working, involved, doing things that will both enrich their educational experience and provide them with good work experience even before they finish their studies. So- And there are lots of internships. Like we have a student, I have one of my students doing, he's a computer science student undergrad, but grad can do this too, is do internships over the summer. You have to get special permission from Andrew immigration wise to work off campus. You're only as an international student allowed to work on campus, but it is possible to get internships on and off campus um, during the summer and, uh, on the program. And that's called curriculum practical training. It has to be related to your major, has to be part of your program, um, but it is possible to get work permissions to do that. Uh, and we'll get into more of that details. And we really, we do have lots of internships. A lot of our students do graduate with internships. Um, some people were asking me, undergrad, about living off campus. Please email me directly and we'll talk about it. Um, and, um, and we'll talk about it. Yeah, for the, um, for the WhatsApp group, you know, I see there's a question, you know, about creating a WhatsApp group. You know, you can most certainly uh, connect with any other students that, you, that you're able to. That, that, that's really awesome. Um, maybe, maybe send me an email about that uh, because I don't want to have too many, you know, on, well, it's, it's not that I don't wanna, I mean, I'm just saying for the one that I put out there, I need to kind of have a, a main group, whether it's Facebook or WhatsApp, but, you know, definitely you are welcome to connect with any other students, but if you'd like to send me an email about that too, and we can figure that out as well. So at the beginning of the school year, some people are asking about jobs on campus. Um, there's tons of job fairs and there's a big job fair usually the week after campus starts, their classes start. Um, and even at orientation, there are people advertising. So for there's every kind of job, if you're undergrads, we have um, people, the most, the place that hires the most student is the cafeteria. Uh, the cool thing about working in the cafeteria, to be honest, is that you get free food. Um, the other place, and a lot of the grad students, even though if they don't live on campus, are working in the cafeteria, because I go there and I say hi to everyone all the time. And, but there's also, like I said, tutoring jobs, working in the library, working in labs, working, sometimes you're doing research with a professor and it's not a grad assistantship, but you're still doing research with a professor. Um, Andrew office hires a lot of students. Brian's office hires students. My office hires students. Um, it is known on campus that international students, unless you guys are doing an internship, the only job you could have on campus or only job you're allowed to have is an on-campus job. So I'll be honest, don't tell the domestic students. There's probably a little bit of a priority to hire international students on campus. Um, there's tons and tons of jobs. And, um, and I, it's been very few, we do not have a medical school. Um, it's very few, um, I don't know if that's true. Is it possible to join a sorority as an exchange undergrad student? I'm not sure. <laughs> yeah, I'm not, um, I'm sure. Andrew, you know that? Yeah, I'm not completely sure about that. I mean, I would think that, you know, it could definitely join in some activities and things like that. I'm, I'm not quite sure, but, you know, even if you just join, whether it's a sorority or any or organization, you know, if you're just here for a semester, usually they're more than happy to have you just join in some activities yeah. and meetings. We have over 200 clubs on campus. And so, and if you're not part of a sorority or fraternity, then you just make friends and they'll invite you to the parties and the other activities and stuff like that. Um, but like I said, there's, I've never had a student tell me they can't find a job on campus. If they really, it might not be the most glamorous job. A lot of my students even have two or three jobs because maybe this job is only 10 hours a week. Um, we, do, we don't currently have a two week quarantine because you guys have to have a vaccination, or not vaccination, you have to have a COVID test prior to entering the US. You don't um, have to have a um, two week quarantine. You might be, we might require, we're still figuring it out because you know, what we said last week is changed to this week. The world is changing so quickly, you know, that we're still developing the rules. And, I think, and what I tell you today might be slightly different, but right now we do not have a two week quarantine. You might have to have a second COVID test um, after arrival, because you know you traveled and you might have been exposed, um, but 
right now we do not have a two week point. Um, and um, we have a really strong job placement. The Career Center helps you with that um, after graduation. I, I wanna go back to another question, an important question I saw. Um, there, there are many, many helps and many, um, uh, 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 a lot of assistance for even those who might have a disability of some kind. Um, there's a, a center called the Access and Accommodation uh, Resources. And so that would help any student that would have some kind of um, need for different kind of accommodation or some kind of extra help in their, uh, um, uh, dur during their time here. So we have a lot of that kind of thing. We even had a, what was that, like two years ago, we had a blind exchange. Yes, program. yeah, that, that was one he of- He was great. <laughs> that was one of the coolest experiences that, that I personally had as working with international students. There was a student from France, uh, but he was originally from Mali. Right. And he was completely blind, but he came um, totally on his own and came to Valpo. And I, I was really amazed. I mean, he was, he was, you know, did so much more than I could have ever done, you know, coming and finding his way all around campus, just uh, being so active in all the activities that went on and the access and accommodation um, uh, center helped him transcribe his uh, materials all into a form that he could read them in. So it was yeah. really, really cool. And, and it doesn't have to be that, you know, yeah. I, you know, I have a, I have a learning disability, so I, I needed help taking notes and stuff like that. So the office helps with all levels of accommodation. Yeah. If you need, mm -hmm. if you have dyslexia or if you're attention deficit disorder, you know, we, the office helps with all levels, you know, from being blind to, you know, maybe having attention deficit disorder. Yeah. Um, I put the link for that. Um, we have some more questions. Um, you are allowed to do up to 364 days of full-time CPT before it affects your OPT. So if you do a, a one year of full-time OPT or CPT, that's what you do while you're studying the internship, it could affect your OPT. But okay. if you do, you do less or if it's considered part-time, it will not affect your OPT. CPT yeah, I, is for F1s. Yeah, I, I would definitely say that um... It's extremely rare that grad students or, or any students will do more than one semester of full-time uh, CPT, um, full-time internship. So usually CPT does not affect the post-completion OPT. So CPT is curriculum practical training. It's an internship for F1 students while they are studying. Um, most popular plan to do it for grad or undergrad is usually in the summer. So if you did three months, you know, three years in a row, it still would be less than that amount of time if you did it full time. Um, and OPT, optional practical training, is once you graduate, it's your work permission. To, and this is for F1s. Jay, you have something slightly different. Um, and it's for after graduation um, and you get one year initially and then you can get something called a STEM extension. That's two more years. Both CPT and OPT has to be <coughs> directly related to your major. So if you are studying biochemistry and you wanna go do a internship at Apple doing computer programming, not related to your major. So it has to be both CPT and OPT or has to be directly related to your major. Um, another question about vaccination. If you can get it before you arrive, we would like you to do it. And you'll get, and if you haven't already, you'll get an email about that. Uh, I don't think the grad students have gotten the email yet. And it can be any vaccination off the WHO list, um, which I posted earlier and I'll try to find again. Um, if you can, if you cannot, then you need to email us and let us know. And we understand that vaccinations are hard to get in a lot of countries, or maybe even in Europe. I know what what age are you guys at in Germany right now, Mark? I'm calling on you, Mark. Can you get the vaccination in Germany right now? Yeah, I already okay. got one. So. Excellent, Mark. Like I was talking to someone in Spain the other day, and they said they're just vaccinating 60 year olds right now. Yeah, so it's, you it's here you... too. It's here too. It's <laughs> just I have a priority. So Mark, Mark's connected. Um, so so. <laughs> So it, it, you know, it doesn't matter if you're in Europe or in, in, in India or Nepal, it's challenge. I mean, hey, 
If you went in the US, we could get it to you like this. That should not be why you're studying in the US, but in a lot of places around the world, it's not as easily to get right now. So, you know, we will help you and work with you. You will need a test to get in the US though. But if you can't get it before you arrive, then we, we will help you after you arrive to get a vaccination. And like I said, there's only two ways to be exempted. One is a religious reason and the other one is a medical and you still need to submit a form for that. And the vaccine should be free. It should be- It is free. Yeah. Come here. Yes, definitely. We've had none of our students, uh, tons of our current students have gotten it. Yeah. Um, <laughs> there is a question. Uh, Ryan, you taped this thing. Are you gonna email this out to everyone? Yeah, this is being recorded right now. So Mark, uh, we talked briefly about COVID and uh, reasons for choosing Valpo, but I'll recommend, uh, you know, once we have this uploaded to YouTube, we're gonna send an email out to everybody who was invited to um, share the recording. So you'll be able to view it just to get more of that in-depth information. Okay, thanks. Mm -hmm. uh... There was a question about the I-20 being sent. Um, so um, as long as you have submitted your financial statements and all the documents to Marcy or, or Ryan. Um, once everything is in there, was, as far as the required documents, financial statement and all that you've been admitted and all that, then they pass it over to me and I create the I-20. It's usually a few days, um, under a week, hopefully that uh, once they pass it to me, I create the I-20 and I send that to you by email. So, um, be on the lookout for emails from international at valpo.edu. Uh, the emails go out explaining how to access your electronic scan of your I-20. Yeah, we have had a lot of uh, applications. We've seen quite a surge in applications this year compared to last year. So we're processing a large volume at present, but we're hoping to get things out pretty quickly here. And there's still some applications, some applicants who haven't received their admissions yet. So be on the lookout, I would say within the next week or next, if you have completed your application as a graduate student, but you haven't received a decision yet, we should be getting those out to you pretty quickly. Um, Sarah asked a question about having a specific card to pay for public transportation. Um, <clears throat> so, no, I wouldn't say there's a specific card. Um, you just have to have your Valpo ID card to, to ride the local V-Line bus he, here in Valpo. So that's just right. your uh, Valpo ID card. And you can ride it if you don't have it as well. Um, you can pay just a little bit, maybe a dollar or two to ride that V-Line bus here in Valpo. And all students will get an ID card when they arrive here. One of the things you do as a new student. So you won't have to remember to apply for that or do something special. We'll be encouraging you to get your one card which will then open you up to use public transportation and other fun services. And you guys will be getting your, your unless you're a J1 student, um, everyone else will be getting their I-20 electronically. So you guys right. will get an email, as, as Andrew said, from him, his office, and it will tell you how to sign in to establish your Valpo email address. And then you guys will need to download it, and it needs to be in color, and, for, and the embassy is supposed to take it. Um, if you are a student from India, do not try to enter before, uh, you know, you guys should be okay because it says the start date is after August 14th, first, I mean, um, and I think that's the rule in Brazil too, maybe. Um, so, so there's not necessarily a cover note, but um, we have heard that all consulates around the world, as far as we know, are accepting the, the, the electronic I-20 and in the email that we send you with the I-20, there's, there's an FAQ sheet. So that also explains that students are allowed to get the electronic I-20. So print off that too and take it with you just in case. Right. And if you have any trouble, let us know, okay? We, um, we've been dealing with this. I, China, seriously, the visa appointments just opened up a week ago and our students are raring to go and They've already had their visa appointments. And let me tell you, China's probably the most picky country um, in the world. Um, uh, you said earlier that we will get an email for the pre-orientation programs, the FOCUS and um, I think FOCUS was it called? 
Um, do we have to register for it or something? Because you said something that we have to uh, Brad register. Brad doesn't need to something. register. Do they register? Oh, okay. No, you really don't need to register. You're going to get information about how to attend times and then just make sure you show up. Um, okay. So no registration needed. Um, some questions. Undergrad, hold on. Undergrad does okay, need to register. Any of your okay. exchange students. You can contact me if you have trouble. Right. I also have a question. Have a question. Uh, if I will arrive with my mom, because she wants to see like the room, all of the stuff, and also uh, where she can live for some time. I'm sorry. Why you contact where me? She can live. She'll have to stay in a hotel or a bed and breakfast, or some parents have choose to do Airbnbs and stuff like that. Yeah, there are there are some Airbnbs even in Uptown, right, Marcy? There's some some good. Airbnbs. Are there? Yes. Yeah, there were. Oh, that's cool. Um, I haven't checked the past couple of weeks, but I know that there were some. Airbnbs right off campus that would be very convenient. So Airbnbs, if you're not familiar, are often people renting uh, houses or rooms in a house and they are often have a kitchen access and they are for short term rentals. And even if you guys are you know, living off campus, you need a place to land. Um, it's to do it's, they're short term, but they're usually a private person renting it and it can be for a week or two weeks or even a month. Um, there were some questions I wanted to get to from earlier, um, some specific to grad too. I know somebody asked about living arrangements for grad student, graduate students on campus. And um, Andrew or Marcy, if you've heard differently, let me know. But I think I heard recently that graduate students will not have living, uh, the possibility to live on campus in the dorms. I had not heard that. I thought they could. Because I was reaching out to residential life about it. So, and normally the arrangements they put out for graduate students are short term. So I think Mark, in your case, as a visiting student, you'd be fine, right? But I think that um, broadly speaking, as a graduate student, you're going to be living off campus. If you need to make short term arrangements, reach out to us. We might be able to flex with them on that. Um, and just make sure you get settled in somewhere. But um, your primary um, living arrangements as a graduate student, I think, will have to be on campus if you're degree seeking, if you're studying uh, in a degree program. Um, there are also questions about internships, scholarships, aid, and funding. Graduate students, and probably for undergrad too, or if you want to confirm, um, scholarships are determined at the point of admission. So if you were going to receive a scholarship, it would be on your admission letter. Um, and aid and funding, not really available for international students, right? You have to provide funding yourself. You have to be able to demonstrate your ability to fund your studies in advance of being able to start. So there's not a whole lot of aid and funding out there apart from the scholarships that we provide at uh, the onset of uh, your studies, if you receive them. Of course, they're merit-based. Um, we have a limited supply of them that we're able to give out. Um, so if you do receive them, you know, congratulations on receiving one. If you didn't, still congratulations because admission is a competitive process and studying in the United States is really the opportunity of a lifetime for many students. So um, it's still very good, very worthwhile for you. And especially at the graduate level, tuition is very reasonable. Um, internships and placement questions I heard. Uh, there's one thing I wanna emphasize for the graduate students, right? And that's that you really need to be involved in your studies. You really need to be active and energetic. Now, many graduate programs require an internship. Um, some graduate programs give other options. They'll say that you can do a research project or something else instead of doing an internship as your capstone experience. I highly recommend internships. Um, I, but I do think there's something you also have to bring something to the table in terms of pursuing them. You really have to develop a close relationship with your program director, which most program directors, if not all of them, will be happy to do that with you. And you really have to fight and make sure that you land one too, right? It's easy to come and then kind of sink in and uh, coast through and then at the last minute think, oh no, I need to do something. And if you do it like that, it's not going to work. You're going to have a hard time finding an internship. So you need to be sure that you are working from kind of day one, planning it out. It's something that you'll want to do as your capstone, which is usually 
towards the end of your studies, your final semester. Um, so very important that you bring something to the table. You are very active and interested in doing it, right? So I just highly recommend. And if you are um, active, if you are engaged and you really want to get one, I guarantee you can get one, be able to find something for you. I totally agree. It's not handed to you, but we will help you achieve the goal if you guys work with us. And that's the story with studies in general, right? You're going to have to work hard at your studies, especially at the graduate level. It's a different story from undergraduate, right? Graduate students are expected to bring a certain amount of initiative with them. They're expected to bring a certain level of existing expertise, preparation for advanced studies. Um, it's no joke at the graduate level. Uh, you can get C's in undergrad. You can kind of coast a little bit here and there at the graduate level. If you get one C, you're going to get a warning. If you get two, you're going to be on your way out. We do not tolerate grades lower than C, and C's are not good grades to get. So most graduate students, you know, maybe at undergrad, if you get like a 3.6 or 4.0 GPA, that's like, oh, wow, you know, it's a good thing for you, but, you know, there's plenty of room below. At the graduate level, most students have 4.0 GPAs. Most students are operating already with high GPAs, right, because they're expected to perform at that level. So it's still a very good opportunity for you if you've been admitted. That means that we have found you to have the potential to succeed in our programs. So we are excited to have you here. But once you get here, take your studies very seriously. I've seen many cases, students dismissed, especially for an international student, it can be a very challenging experience. You don't wanna be dismissed academically and then be told you have to go to your home country, you have to evacuate immediately, those kinds of uncomfortable conversations. So take your studies seriously. Now we have lots of support, we have lots of resources. When you have trouble in your studies, let us know. We have people who will help you. But take your studies seriously, bring the initiative, bring your enthusiasm, and I guarantee you're going to have a great experience. Uh, Ryan, there's a question from a grad student. Is, it option, is there an option to change your course after you get there? Undergrad, yes. Grad, what's the answer? Um, it depends very much on time and place. So if you are in advance of coming, if you just got your admission to one program, you're thinking of changing it, um, usually you can apply to a different program. You'll go through the review process again. You'll have to submit another essay indicating your reasons for pursuing this new program and really making sure, you know, that you demonstrate well why you're wanting to change programs. So in advance of arrival, it's straightforward. You can change your program. You can get accepted to another program. Once you arrive, this is a much trickier story. Um, we really don't like it when students show up and then decide they want to switch programs because uh, at the graduate level, you're not necessarily going to be accepted into another program, right? They're going to look at your studies. They're going to evaluate you. Every application, you can't just change it. You actually have to be evaluated for acceptance into the other program. It might nullify a scholarship if you receive one for one program. Um, you might not receive it for another program, different criteria by program. So there are options. Um, and the further along you get, the fewer options you have. So definitely be sure in advance that you pick the right program for you. If you get here and things don't work out, I won't say it's impossible to you know, still change things up but it's a much more challenging process and there's going to be a lot of people who are gonna to need to approve it and look at your situation. And it's not really a process you wanna go, go through. So definitely be sure you've prepared and you've selected the right program prior to arrival. Somebody asked about the visa acceptance rate for international students. Um, it's a tough That's question. Tricky. It's yeah. tricky from country to country. It's tricky from major to major. I mean, within India, and I think this might be an Indian student, it's tricky from city to city. Um, and and anything we actually would have said a year ago, I would actually say we are in a brand new world. So a lot of the rules that were out there a year ago or things that were normal a year ago are different now. J1s, don't sweat it because you guys are exchange students and you have strong ties to home. Um, F1s, it's, it's, it's be out being prepared. And like I said, um, Maybe some of you guys joined late, Ryan said. Some of, especially on the grad level, and occasionally on the undergrad, you might do a visa interview twice. If you've been turned down once, I have a meeting, I think tomorrow with one of our, I think he's a Nigerian student. 
who's gone once, got turned down, we're going to do a little visa prep 101 with him. But really think about those questions and we'll email out this, um, this uh, video of our presentation and we'll email it to you guys. But really think about those questions. Keep your answers brief. Well, Mark just went for his. How was your visa interview, Mark? Anything you want to ask? What kind of questions did they ask you? Oh, I don't. I didn't have the interview oh, yet. Right. It's on seventeenth of June. Yeah. Uh, but I'm. So I'm out of yet. Well, okay. I'm applying for the J one. So yeah, and then the question be. might be a slightly different. Yeah. But you know, I've seen them. I've watched them do it, and my friend does it. Like I said, keep it brief. Your answers. Know how you're paying for your college. Your parents are paying for it. It's not an answer. You know, be prepared. You know, mm. and know why Valpo. Don't say, you know, there's a Valpo chili. I've seen, you know, what I used to work at a school that was in Washington state and they said, oh, I'm going to live with my relatives in Virginia. Well, Washington state is by California. Virginia is by Washington, D.C. So they failed their visa. Watch YouTube videos. Separate sizes. Know country. how you're paying for it. Be prepared. Um, Emmanuel, you asked a question. You said you're planning to travel on the 18th of July. You need help in securing a place to offer on campus, off campus is priority. I'd say send me an email, Emmanuel. Um, I'll send you some resources, some lists of uh, apartments, other options, and we can talk further about like, you know, what you're looking at, what your price range might be, and we'll see uh, what we can get set up for you. I also right. put the link for off campus housing there. Um, okay. Yes, sir. Uh, yes, sir. Uh, sir, I want to ask that I need to recommend a friend who wants to do master's in criminology. So are we offering master's in criminology? Unfortunately, Unfortunately no. not a program that we have. So. Oh, okay. Okay. Undergrad only. Okay. Yeah. Um, online classes for fall if we were unable to be there due to any COVID-19 cases. So it's a good question. Valpo has been very flexible and very uh, rapid in making decisions when it comes to modality and given COVID-19 cases and the fluctuations thereof. So they do it case by case situation, right? They look at what the numbers are at. And if things start to spike up, if another wave starts to pop up, I'm sure they'll go back to an online modality, but we're really not expecting that. So we're looking to have in-person coursework there are still some online classes here and there for international students, but you have to be enrolled in the appropriate amount of in-person coursework to maintain your visa status. Um, so there may be opportunities here and there, but I would say if the modality has to change because of some change in the case numbers or a new wave that, um, you know, it will be decided kind of around the time that it happens. So the university is looking out for the welfare of all of their students with the vaccination, vaccination requirement in place. We don't expect there to be any more waves. Um, but if anything changes, of course, the universities will, will take action very quickly on it. And, and if you can't get a visa, you know, contact us and we'll see if there's an option for you maybe to start online. But we can't make any guarantees. Like I said, things, anything we say, you know, rules are changing as the days speak. So yeah, we we're really, you know, students. working. And uh, huh? Emmanuel is actually one of them who started remotely and was able to obtain his visa. And we're really excited about seeing him in the fall. So congratulations, Emmanuel. We're looking forward to seeing you at orientation. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah. So, so I, wanted, I wanted to ask about uh, orientation. I already attended one uh, last semester, but it was virtual. Do I need to, to, to attend this one? Visit? Right. The one that's coming in the fall? You need to attend OIPs for certain because you have to sign, check in with them. Yeah. Um, I'll ask our orientation team what they think because they're still deciding on the modality of it. And I think if it turns into an online orientation, they may not require you to attend if it's going to be the same material you already have. So um, I'll check with them on that, but include that in your email to me if you would. We'll talk about that and uh, residences. All right. Yeah, I, I just want to say a word about the the orientation, um, yeah, Emmanuel, I think it'd be very important if you for, for you to come to the, the fall 2021, August 17 um, international student orientation, uh, because we go over a lot of the, the, the immigration details, but we also go over a lot of cultural details for students who, who are coming to the US for the first time. And so I just wanna say that that orientation is required. It's not an option. 
Um, of course, the world has been crazy for the past year. So we, we want to help any student in, in whatever situation they're in. You know, if they get their visa interview on the 17th, we're not going to say, you know, don't come, you know, because you can't hear, be here right on that date. But for those of you who can, you know, who have your visa and you can come, that is a required date. You know, I, I lived in Japan and China. Uh, China was actually the place that I went to when I was an adult, kind of like you. I, I went to, uh, um, not, not to teach English there when I was oh, 22 or so. And so I had people who helped me to know how to live in China. And I've heard of people going to China or going to other places who didn't have a very good experience, but I, I had an awesome experience there because I had orientation. I wasn't a, a student, but I had that orientation. Um, people told me how to live, you know, where to go, what to do in that setting. And I had a great experience. And so that's what you get at our orientation. We, we see that students who come in really late or don't come to our orientation often have a difficult time here. They, they don't get connected with other students or people in the community. And, you know, they don't get connected with their professors as well. So the orientation is extremely important when you first come in. So the, the orientation will be, will there be some, I don't know, you said like you have a lot of uh, student um, clubs or something. Um, will they present themselves there or? Yes, yeah. So what we do in the international orientation, we start out with the immigration stuff. So, so you don't, you know, uh, jeopardize or, uh, go against the, the rules of your F1, J1 stats. So that's the first thing. We, then we bring in different student organizations. We bring in our international student organization and they talk about everything they do. We bring in the Valpo Police uh, Department. Now you may, you may think that's kind of scary, but actually the Valpo Police officers are really friendly and they, the students actually love that session almost, you know, one of the best ones because They give some role plays about what to do if the police stop you when you're driving or just, you know, lots of fun things like that. Very friendly police officers. We bring in the health center. So they tell about, you know, what to do if you need to use your health insurance. We bring in, um, we bring in friendship families, a local group that gives you a chance to meet local families, all that kind of thing for a couple of days. And hopefully we take a trip to the, to the dunes if, If we can start doing that again this year, the the Lake Michigan beachfront, we take a little trip out there. So stuff like that. Um, Thanks. There's a question about orientation dates. OIP's orientation is on the 17th and focuses on the 18th, right, Marcy? And about the, the Saudi club. So we actually have a good number of Saudi students now. Uh, we had We had a lot of Saudi students about, I don't know, six or seven years ago. And then we didn't have very many for a few years, but now we have, well, hopefully in the fall, maybe we'll have 15 or, or 20, you know, hopefully we'll get more coming. And so uh, they're very connected to each other. Last year, we didn't have a Saudi club, but if we get enough students that are interested in it, it can start up, you know, as soon as you get here. <laughs> Um, we're running a little over time, everybody, so I think I'd like to call it here, release everybody to their days.